jump in on part three of our On Guard series. We've been talking about the things that we look at, the things that we hear, understanding that those are the things that permeate the very being of our heart, and then that which is in our heart pours forth from our mouth. Jesus says it this way in Matthew chapter 12. By now, you probably already got this thing memorized. It's not a bad thing to memorize scripture in church, huh? Jesus says, he says, for the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. A good man brings good things out of the good that is stored up within him, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil that is stored up in him. And it's from this understanding that we don't just say stuff for the sake of saying things, but we're pulling from the reserves of our hearts that we want to be intentional about the things that we place before our eyes, the things that we set our ears towards, because we understand that those things The things before the eyes, the things that we allow into our ears, those two gates right there determine that which is in our heart. As I was meditating on this specific scripture, I'm not even using this for the rest of the message, but just sitting in worship this week and meditating on this scripture, Holy Spirit just kept bringing back into focus, it's whatever it is full of. It's whatever it is full of. It was, and I saw this picture that the heart is not just a tube or a highway where we take things in and then it just runs right through us and comes out the front. But the heart is a reservoir. It is a container that when I start taking things in on the eyes, when I start taking things in through the ears, that the heart doesn't just let it run right on through, but it begins to fill up the innermost part of who I am. It begins to permeate the way that I think, my will and my emotions. And that's why as a follower of Christ, when we talk about living a life that invites others to embrace Jesus, that's why I can go through a hard day and I don't have to be shaken by what's happening today because I have a reserve in my heart that is full of the word of God. It's not just full of the words, it's full of a history that has been built through the relationship that I have with Christ. So even when I come against a problem that seems impossible, I can go back to that reserve and I say, no, I remember you were faithful back then and you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so if you were faithful then, you're faithful now. And I know you're carrying me through until tomorrow because we've been reading, he who begins the good work, he sees it through until the end. He works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. plan. So I have this reserve in my heart that I don't have to react to what's happening around me, but I can respond according to the word of God based on the things that I place before my eyes and my ears. And so I'm, I'm contemplating the weightiness of this heart that is this tank that is designed to hold the truth of the word of God. And I heard this question, uh, I was riding back from a worship service Tuesday morning, and I heard this question just rise up. It was, but what happens when the heart is broken? The heart is designed by nature to be filled and to carry, to be used as a resource to tap into. But what do I do when my heart is broken? And if you can just play along with the analogy and it's leaking. I think a lot of times we, we run around with a broken heart without even realizing it because it's been so normal. But what am I supposed to do when I get before the word of God and I read the words and the words make sense, but it's all up here. It can't be contained in the heart because the cart just keeps pouring it back out. What do I do whenever I hear the truth of God's word? And this is what it looks like in the life of the believer. I read the scriptures. I can quote you the scriptures and I'll say amen as the pastor is preaching the scriptures. But when you look at the way that I function in life, I have a hard time living out that truth that I know in my head is the truth of the word of God. But in my heart, it's just hard to tap into that sometimes. I just wonder if it's because we're walking around with a brokenness in our heart that's struggling to carry the truth of God's word. But what I understand is is that when we made the decision to follow Christ, when we stepped into this revelation and received the salvation of Jesus Christ, it affected us in three specific spots because you remain body, soul, and spirit. You guys believe that? Body, soul, and spirit. And I wanna show you in scripture real quick how that salvation plays into the brokenness of our lives, but also into those three areas. First of all, in your body, 2 Corinthians, and I'm thankful for this, y'all. I mean, (laughs) this is good. Paul says, he goes, for we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is when we die and we leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body made for us by God himself and not by human hands. We grow weary in our present body and we long to be put in our heavenly bodies like new clothing. Now I'm thankful for that because this body, I'm 38 years old now and I get to hang out with some of these young guys and I felt, I saw Logan, 
he was he was struggling a little bit this morning. I'm like, oh, you're feeling it, bro. Welcome, welcome to those mid-20s. <laughs> like creeping in there. Things that you used to be able to pull off when you were a teenager, you don't quite get to do. Things that you get to pull off when you had two kids, you don't quite get to do once you start busting out the third child. Like there's just things that this body just starts breaking down slowly but surely. Even though I've made the decision to follow Christ, this this body's guaranteed to be laid to rest. I don't know about you, but when I made the decision to follow Christ, I didn't get six inches taller. The hair didn't get a little bit more lush. The skin didn't start glowing just right. The body didn't change. It will change. Paul's saying that we're going to transition from this life to the next, and salvation will have an effect on the body, but not quite yet. Now, the spirit, the spirit is eternally secure. I'm not more saved in 10 years in my spirit than what I am today. And he says it right here in Ephesians 1.13. He says, when you've heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and you believed in him, you were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So the spirit is secure from the moment of the revelation and the response, but then the soul, the heart and the soul, those are often interchanged throughout scripture because the heart is at the seat of the soul. And Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4.16, it says the outer self is wasting away. And yet for those who are the believers, it says the inner self is being renewed day by day. The body will be transformed. The spirit is forever changed. But now the soul is being renewed day by day by day. And I'm going to show this to you throughout the scripture, but I can also just relate to this on a very practical level. There are some days, anybody with me, where the thoughts, your soul, right? We're talking about thoughts, will, and emotions. There's some days where the thoughts are just the good thoughts. Like, I'm just a happy boy. Like, we're good to go. <laughs> thoughts are going good. But then there's other days where it's like, it's just something triggers me, and I just start seeing things, and it just starts cycling, this negativity in there. And so Paul is saying, in response to your thoughts, he says in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, he says, you have to take every thought captive to obey Christ. The good and the bad, all brought within the context of the word of God. I have to take those thoughts captive every single day because the heart is being transformed daily towards him. But what happens when the heart is broken? What happens when the heart is broken? You have points where it might be just like a little rough and you say, well, if the day is going good, then yeah, I can respond in a positive way. But I've seen the brokenhearted who love God with all their heart, but they're still struggling with this brokenness that I can't get my thoughts off the negativity. You see them and it's like, it doesn't matter how good life, it's like you have all the things, all the material possessions you could ever ask for. Kids are healthy, you're healthy, you got the finances, you got the toys, you got the life, and yet when the heart is broken, it's never, it's never enough. The thoughts always go towards, yeah, but what if? The thoughts always lean into, yeah, but there is that one thing. The brokenhearted struggle in that thought process. The brokenhearted struggle with the will, the thing that drives them. And so you have life coaches and motivational speakers that say, hey man, put before you the big house that you want. Put that vacation, put that dream family before you. Put all these things in place, understanding that that's gonna bring a momentary happiness. And then when that doesn't satisfy anymore, then we can go on to the next thing. You gotta be driven by the dreams. But the call of the believer is to not be driven by the things of this world, but be driven by the call and the purpose that God has placed over your life. The Proverbs say in Proverbs 4.23, it says you have to guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. We talked about Eugene Peterson uh, last week, the writer of the message translation of the Bible, and he wrote this book. It's a long obedience in the same direction. If you guys haven't picked that up, I would recommend it. Long obedience in the same direction. And he says in that book, the direction is more important than the pace. You know, you can listen to The Rock and he's saying, are you living your best life? Are you living at 110%? No. Most days I'm doing good to be at 70. I might only be going five miles an hour, but I am confident that I'm going in the right direction. Because what good would it be to be hitting 100, but be going the wrong way? If I'm trying to get towards Denton, what good is it that I hop on 380 and run west? Like I'm never going to get there. It doesn't matter how fast I'm moving. It might look good on the outside, but when God is looking at my life through the lens of eternity, he's saying, you're going the wrong way, brother. Going the wrong way. So the will has to be transformed daily, not to be driven by the things that this world has to offer, but I am driven by the call and the purpose of the Lord in my life. And then the emotions, the roller coaster of emotions. In Proverbs 25, 28, he says, a man without self-control is like a city broken into and left without walls. When you are struggling with that area of the broken heart, it's like all it takes, the littlest thing to trigger. I just got to see Ethan's face sometimes, and it's like, man, it just makes me want to punch a wall. Like, I don't know. What it is. It's like, what happened? My emotions are just running wild. There's no reserve. There's no love of the Lord that I have in this broken heart. It's just constantly being poured out, and so all it takes is that one moment to trigger something, one moment, 
One of the struggles that I have as a pastor over the last 18 years, honestly, is I love to do life with people, but it is very frustrating to see how hard it is for people to genuinely change. And I don't want to seem like a pessimist here, but it is. It's rare that you see somebody genuinely make a full 180 and start running. Now, do they love the Lord? Yes. Will they go to heaven? Yes. But to start making those little changes. That's one of the frustrating things, even in counseling, like you're talking to somebody and you're like, this seems so easy right now. Like, how do you not see this on the outside? But when you're in the midst of it, when you're in the midst of that brokenness, it seems impossible. But I'm here to tell you, we serve a God that knows how to heal the brokenhearted. And I believe that what the Holy Spirit is wanting to do in this place this morning is to bring real, authentic healing that will manifest throughout your life in change. Change that people will notice, change that will empower you to help live a life that invites them to embrace Jesus because they say, because I think we kind of know this. You know, during the pandemic, it was like, everything's going to change. We're never going to go back to the way it was we're pretty much back to the way it was. Like I'm, you know, getting bumped out of my seats in the movie theaters and it was like, all the movie theaters are gonna close down, all the restaurants. The only thing that changed with the restaurants is the service is really bad. Like, <laughs> we were already heading that direction. But it's like we all, there's this propensity of the human heart to just wanna go back to what is normal, whatever is comfortable. Like what Robert said, we just don't like change. Like there's just something about us. Even if the change is dysfunctional, even if the change is hurtful, there is something about us that just says, mm, no, I'll, I'll hang with it for a little bit longer. But I want to call our fellow followers of Christ here to accountability and say, this is a season of new beginnings. This is a season of refreshing. This is a season of meaningful change, not just within our community, but within your lives personally. Change that is going to affect generations to come. I'm saying, to this, saying this to you, not just as hype, but this is prophetic. I see this. I believe that we are in a season of change. I'm expecting great change to happen. So would you guys turn to your Bibles with me? First Samuel chapter one. This is where we're gonna stand for a while. We are going to read about a lady by the name of Hannah. And man, if anybody in the Bible had an authentic heart change in response to her interaction with Christ, it was Hannah. It was powerful. When you find it, 1 Samuel chapter 1, we're going to jump in on verse 4. Would you just stand with me real quick? Honor God in the reading of his word in this place. We don't do this out of a religious habit. I honestly love to do this because it's just a physical posture that reminds me that I'm reading the word of God, that I'm standing to attention as the Lord speaks. If we had a dignitary walk into this place and he spoke, we would stand in honor just the fact that he's about to come and communicate to us, even if we didn't vote for him. Amen. Anyways, here we go. First Samuel chapter one, verses four, and I'm gonna go all the way down to the end of the story. I'll jump around a little bit, so stay with me. Here we go. Verse four, it says, on the day that Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Peniah, and, his wi uh, and her sons and all her daughters, to Hannah, he would give a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Now say that with me. The Lord had closed her womb. Who closed her womb? The Lord had closed her womb. That'll mess with somebody's theology. And her rival used to provoke her grievous, grievously to irritate her because, look again, it's, like, it's almost like, it's almost as if God knew how to write in such a way that he could get the attention of the person that was trying to read. He drives this home. Lord closes her womb, and then she is provoked grievously to, irri the, to irritation because, why? He says it again, because the Lord closed her womb. So it went on year by year. We're talking about process here now. It didn't just happen once, but year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more than 10 sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. And Eli, the priest, was sitting the seat uh, beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look upon the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor will touch his head. Now let's jump down to verse 17 because Eli kind of gives her a little flack in the way that she's talking to the Lord and once he realizes that he was in the wrong, he goes back and he says, it says that Eli answered, he said, go Hannah, go in peace 
and may the God of Israel grant to you what you have asked of him. Verse 18, she said, may the servant find favor in your eyes. And she went on her way. She ate something. Her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning, they rose and they worshiped before the Lord and they went back to their home in Ramah. Elkanai made love to his wife. Thank you, Jesus. And the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah became pregnant, gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel saying, because I asked the Lord for him. Whoo, Lord, let a praise rise up on our lips, a praise that rises forth before we ever see the miracle. And then once the miracle has come, let the praise increase even greater. Lord Jesus, let our lives be a worship unto you as we respond to that still, small voice. We invite you, once again, Holy Spirit, to come and speak. We say like Samuel said, your servant is listening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. I'm coming to tell you this morning that God knows how to heal your broken heart. God knows how to heal the broken heart. We kind of went, you know, the Debbie Downer route there with the intro. A lot of times you're supposed to give like a good hype intro to get everybody like, Jesus. But I just want to lay this foundation so you kind of find yourself at the point of this. With a broken heart, it alters the way that we think. It alters the drive of our life. It alters even the emotional state of our day-to-day lifestyle. But I know that God has come to heal the brokenhearted. He recognizes the problems and he doesn't get turned away by those issues. When God encounters Hannah here, he realizes she is encountering a real problem. You guys understand the Jewish culture of that time. This wasn't the will of the Lord, but this was certainly how men and women interacted. The men greatly devalued the women. There was often times where women were sold for cattle or sheep or something very lowly because really in their eyes, the only value that the woman brought to the community was the ability to have a child. And so when Hannah is unable to do the one thing that she has value in in contributing to her family, it brings great distress. I enjoy the fact that it says that every time she went into the presence of the Lord, she had to overcome some type of an obstacle. She was constantly confronted. Man, it's like if she came to the gathering, people just be bopping out kids. Like, don't drink the water here at Reynolds Middle School because there is just, there is pregnancy in the air. Like, you can just, uh, uh, the, a handshake or something like that, next thing you know. Uh, we've actually, like, we're, anyways, it's just getting wild over here. We got lots of, lots of baby makers. That's awesome. Praise God. Um, but Hannah's confronted with this. Everywhere I look, it's, it's there's children, there's children, there's children. In the, in the Jewish writings, uh, we don't see this in the Word, but what we understand through the Jewish writings is that actually Hannah, she's named first in the Bible, and so scholars uh, said that she was the first wife. And then in the Jewish history, uh, they understood that Hannah was actually married to her husband for roughly 10 years before he married the second woman. Now, this is significant, and I want to just kind of put us in the middle of the story here. Hannah's having to look at the thing that is ridiculing her, knowing that it is her inability to produce that's caused this problem. Has anybody had the brokenness that says, you know what, I brought this upon myself? Now, this isn't the truth. Like, Hannah can, couldn't control the fact that she couldn't have a child. The Bible actually says that it was the Lord that had closed her womb. But it was because of her situation that it even more frustrating. So it was bad enough that she couldn't have a kid, but now she's got somebody heckling her at home, rubbing it in her face. The problem was so real. Despite the fact that the spiritual authority over her life was trying to bless her with double portion, didn't ridicule her. We don't read that Elkanai was ridiculing his wife or giving her a hard time because she wasn't able to get pregnant. It says that she would get a double portion. But you understand with a broken heart, husbands, wives, when that spouse is broken, have you ever got to that point where you're like, no, no, I do. Like, I'm, I'm telling you I love you. I'm telling you I care about you. I'm telling you I'm here for you. But they just, when that heart's broken, it's hard to receive. It's hard to store up those good words and that love. And Hannah's in this place where it's like, it's brought her to the point where I can't even eat because I recognize this, there's that lie of the enemy that says, it's my fault. It's my fault that this woman's here. It's my fault that this woman who's heckling me about the fact I can't have kids, it's, it's my fault. God's saying, I'm ready, to, I'm, I'm ready to do a work through you. But the work that he does is done through process. It's not instantaneous. What I love about this story, what I see in the Bible all the time, I tell you guys, if we took process out of the Bible, the Bible would basically just be a pamphlet. 
You know, we had this happen and this, 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 this. But you have the entirety of this book that is the problem. It's the promise, it's the process, it's the fulfillment of the promise that leads to the next promise. And then another process. And we live this life of process with Jesus. And so Hannah's now on this process with God where she's learning to trust God. Can I tell you, you don't want to reject the process because in the midst of rejecting the process, you will inevitably reject the God of the process. Instead of saying, Lord, remove this from me, it's God, would you teach me how to walk through this in a way that is honoring unto your name? Would you teach me the lessons that need to be taught? That's why James would say, he says, ask the Lord, if you need wisdom, if you're going through something and it just seems like, man, this isn't right, this isn't fair, I don't, I don't need this in my life, God, would you give me wisdom? What is this process all about? And we get to see the end of Hannah's story and so the process makes sense in some ways because Hannah, just like so many of us, we're just asking for something that in our minds is simple. And God's not saying no. He's just saying, I'm trying to prepare you, Hannah, because in your mind, you just want a child. In your mind, you just want a child just so you don't have to deal with the ridicule anymore. But I'm wanting to give you a child that you will name Samuel that could arguably be considered, I don't know what, the greatest prophet that we have in the Old Testament. This is Samuel who is going to anoint King Saul and be the voice of the Lord to King Saul. This is Samuel who's going to anoint King David whose lineage will eventually lead to the birth of Christ. Like Hannah's just like, I just want a kid. God says, I have greatness for you, Hannah. But if Hannah would not have gone through the process, she would have treated her son in the same way that Peniah would have treated her kids. Just love them, raise them up, Send him out there to the field to go do the work as the father. But because of the process, it brought her to a place of brokenness where she drew close unto the Lord and made this vow, God, if you will just give me, I just want one. I'm not trying to be the mother of many nations like Abraham or something like that. I just want one. If I could just have one, I will give him to you as soon as he is weaned and he will be yours forever. But just let me have the joy of one child. And there was a brokenness there that process led her. And I want to tell you, some of you guys are too smart for your own good. Some of you guys are too skilled for your own good. Some of you have too many resources at your disposal. And the Lord knows if he gave you everything you were asking for right now, you would just take and say, thank you, Jesus, praise God, and go on about your day. But because of process, because of process, they will bring you to a place of brokenness to say, Lord, I need you to heal this heart and I surrender all that I am unto you. We serve a sovereign God. And part of the beauty of his sovereignty is that he can do whatever he chooses to do to lead me down the path that will fulfill his purpose in my life. And again, that just kind of goes back to God, whatever it looks like, Lord, come have your way. Whatever it takes, I give you my yes. However your glory comes, hear your people say that we want it. It's the cry of my heart. It's the cry of my heart. Now listen to Hannah's prayer here. So we have the problem and we have the process that's bringing us into a maturity with Christ so that we take that which we've been given and we learn to surrender it all unto the Lord. But now we bring ourselves into this moment of the prayer and I love the brokenness of Hannah's prayer. You see the brokenness of this heart, the honesty of this heart. No cute little prayers here. It says that she is deeply distressed. Six different ways that the writer describes Hannah's emotional state. It says she's deeply distressed. It says that she weeps bitterly. It says that she is troubled within her spirit, that she is pouring out her soul. It's that she is moving into the presence of the Lord, watch this now, with anxiety and vexation. I don't know if I've ever hit the vexation point of life. I pray I never get there, but I do not want that state of life to have to be something that I have to rest in. And yet that's exactly where Hannah was at. Deeply distressed, weeping bitterly, troubled in her spirit, pouring her soul out, her thoughts, her will, and her emotions being poured out at the foot of the cross with anxiety and vexation. She pours out her heart unto the Lord year after year after year in the process of being ridiculed by outside voices this brokenness continues to draw close into the Lord knowing that only he can fix the broken pieces of her life I heard a writer say that emotional uh, emotions are the language of the soul Emotions are the language of the soul. And this challenged me in a lot of ways because I have been dubbed by a lot of my family. And we say it jokingly, but there is some truth to it that I have a tendency to be an emotional stone. 
<laughs> like I am not, I never cried at the, at the birth of any of my, my, my girls, but I love them all. Uh, tears aren't just necessarily the way that I express myself most of the time. And yet there are emotions there. There is a response. There is an outward response that is a reflection of what's going on in the depths of your soul. And you want to tap into that. You want to kind of lean into, how am I feeling? What's going on? Like, can I just take inventory of my life right now? How am I doing? How's my heart doing? As Hannah approaches the throne of God, she approaches in honesty, but before she makes her request known, and if you guys take one thing away from this today, please take this. Before she approaches him with the request, let me find it in the verse, she addresses him for who he is. It says right here in verse 11, she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, do you know the name of God? that speaks to your situation. There's power in that name. See, we can meditate, we can focus on the brokenness, and man, I can give you all the symptoms, I can give you the reason for the symptoms, I can give you the diet that I'm supposed to take to fix the symptoms, I know the medications, and I got all this different stuff, but have you taken time to crack into the word, and have you found the name? When Hannah approaches the Lord, she approaches through the pain, through the hurt, through the sorrow of what's going on. She's honest and she's pouring herself out, but she recognizes him as the Lord of hosts. And this is a name that speaks of his sovereignty. This is a militant name that addresses him as the creator of all things. This is a name that says you have control of all things. This is almost, I don't know where the writer originally got this understanding that it was the Lord that had closed her womb, but it's basically Hannah saying, oh Lord of hosts, you are the one that saw fit to allow this to be placed in my life and you are the one that will deliver me. Even in the same way that the Lord uh, waited for Lazarus to die, that doesn't sound like super you know, hippie Jesus, but he waited for the two days for Lazarus to die and the sisters were, why didn't you come a little bit sooner? And he said, it's for the glory of the Lord that this process is going to happen. We will honor him through the process and we address him through the power of his name. When you're going into that place of prayer, come in a place of honesty or the brokenness of your heart, but don't get fixated on the pain. Get fixated on his name. Don't get fixated on the pain. Get fixated on the process. It's not that we have to hide the pain or the emotions, but I just can't let that be the foundation. That brokenness can't be the foundation of my life. The word has to be the rock and my foundation, the word that carries the great name of God. I have to know him as provider. I have to know him as healer. I have to know him as the prince of peace. I have to know him as the one that is the lamp unto my feet and the light unto my path. I have to know him and know that name and know how to call upon that name name in the midst of the pain. Church, you got to find the name. And then the last thing she does is that she doesn't wait for the manifestation of the prayer to be fulfilled in her life to start praising God. And again, the broken heart doesn't have a reserve to pull from, but there was something supernatural that happened in Hannah's life in that moment. And he healed her and he filled her. And before the situation in her womb changed, she began to praise. She began to praise. I like all the practical elements that the word brings out here. It wasn't just, and God did an amazing work and just breathed upon her, and next thing you know, boop, she's nine, month pre- nine months pregnant, has a baby. It says that she went away and she ate something. Come on, there's an outward response of a healed heart that comes. I appreciate any time the Lord has healed me to the place where I can eat food. Like, that's just always a good place to be. When you can eat a little bit of something extra, like I need one more meal in my life. But prior, she was so fixated on the problem that wouldn't change that she didn't even want to eat. And now the problem hasn't changed, but the revelation has come and the heart has been healed. And now she's eating and it says that she, her face was no longer downcast. Again, if we're going to live a life that invites others to embrace Jesus, you can't be walking around looking all broke, busted, and disgusted just like the rest of the world. One of the most powerful things we have as followers of Christ is that we can walk through the exact same situation as everyone else, but we walk through it in a different response because of the fullness of the word of God and the history that we have with him. And so they look and they say, why? Why, why? Why would you act like that? Why would you talk like that? It, you don't speak the way we speak. You don't think the way that we think. You're not driven by the same way. You know, the boss keeps talking about layoffs and you're still working like crazy. It's like that. You don't understand. I don't work for that guy. I work for the Lord. He's the provider. He's the one that takes care of me. It doesn't matter what kind of threats that they make. I have in the reserve of my heart a relationship with Christ that changes the very facet of who I am. There's a brokenness there that tries to steal that joy away. 
But as the Lord begins to heal, she not only eats, but her face looks different. And it wasn't just a, oh, we had a great service Sunday morning, praise God, and then you get over to the restaurant and they're slow with your food and then you get in a wreck on the way home and you lose all your joy by the time you get back to the house. It says that Hannah wasn't just feeling good as she left the presence of the Lord, but the very next morning, early the next morning, they rose and they worshiped the Lord and then they went back to their home. She connected with God again and they still haven't seen a change. Connected with God again, the only thing that had changed is just the brokenness of her heart had been healed and it brought forth a fresh worship before the Lord and then she took it to a whole nother level and connected once again with her husband. There was practical and spiritual working together. Come on, we cannot be a community of faith that's just always like Jesus, 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 and we're just praying and moving, praying and moving. That's, the prayer is powerful. We've dedicated this year as a prayer, as a year of prayer unto the Lord, effectual, fervent prayer of the righteous, availing much. I don't downplay the prayer. I understand that we have to first see it in the spirit, but then there is something in the natural that has to occur. Hannah could not have stayed in that temple. She was not the mother Mary birthing Jesus. There had to be something very practical that was going to take place in the natural so that the fullness of God's promise in her life was going to come to pass. And I want to say to you guys today, pray like crazy. Pray like it all depends on you and you know you're not enough and then live like it all depends on God because you know that you could never be enough. I know that's a little bit different than the way it's normally said, but that's really the way that I see it. If I pray like it all depends on God, I might just be like, eh, you know, Jesus, you know my heart. Help it, amen. But when I'm praying and I recognize, Lord, you don't understand. This is so far out of my control. This is so far out of the control of any professional. They say they can't help. And I'm looking unto you as my only hope, as my only source and my only strength. I need you, Lord God. That prayer sounds different. That prayer looks a lot like Hannah's prayer where there is weeping and there's groaning, there's vexation. We didn't read it, but actually the priest was looking at her and he's like, woman, are you drunk? Like, what is your problem right now? He didn't understand what true prayer through the pain looked like in that moment. So I want to pray like it all depends on me. And then I want to live knowing that it all depends on God so that I never come to the place where I say, look what the Lord has done. Man, you are welcome for my faithfulness over the last two years. Haven't we done good over here? I've been loving, I've been cut. No, it ain't me. That's all Jesus. The praise always has to precede the fulfillment of the promise and then understand that his promise and his plan for us is so much greater than what we could ever ask for. He is here to do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we could ever ask or think. Amen. So let's close it out this way. Help me out, J.D. I serve a God that knows how to heal the brokenness of our lives. I serve a God that's not turned off by brokenness. Psalms 34, 18, it says the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and he saves those who are crushed in spirit. There's an interesting response sometimes that I hear believers say, it's like, I don't want to minister because I haven't been doing the right things. I don't want to minister because there's brokenness there and I don't know how to process that right now. And I think at the root of that, there's this sense of like, I'm not worthy to go into the presence of the Lord. But if you flip that idea, then that means that you could do enough to somehow be worthy to enter into his presence. How does that work? How does that work? How is it that I could somehow be good enough to go before the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Let us not in our brokenness ever come to a place where we forget that we've been washed by the blood of God and that we have been welcomed into his presence just as we are. Broke, busted, and disgusted, he'll take you just as you are. I'm here to tell you, God is not turned off by your brokenness and only God knows how to heal the broken heart. Only God knows how to heal the broken heart. We're going to continue on this journey next week and we're going to start talking about the abundance that comes out of our heart. That it's more than just a name it and claim it message, but there is power when we can name the promise that God has given us and there is power whenever we claim those things that we haven't seen yet in the natural, but we can see it like Elijah in the spirit. A cloud the size of a man's hand that's going to bring rains that haven't been seen for so long. Supernatural breakthrough. I see it in my eye. I'm saying it forth with my mouth. But it has to stir, stir up in my heart. It's not just empty words. Lord, would you heal the brokenhearted? Would you guys stand to your feet with me this morning? Psalms 147.3, he heals the brokenhearted and he binds up their wounds. Mm. We're going to be sensitive with this and um, I'm going to ask Brandon and Wendy to come up here and Lauren 
and we're going to just have a, have a moment just to pray over you guys. Is that cool? Um, not over Brandon and Wendy. Brandon and Wendy are going to help me pray. <laughs> <laughs> These are women of faith. Uh, they have been walking with us now for uh, almost since we started the church. I think you guys came here in, what, October? Or no, you came in January. January. So uh, we had about three, four months to kind of get our stuff together before Brandon and Wendy walked in. And uh, it's been powerful. And they've, uh, they serve as leaders over our small group. Brandon's been a strong voice within my life. Wendy's a powerful prayer warrior. Uh, I think that one of the, uh, one of the best days this year has been when you came up and started praying out and interceding in uh, Mandarin, Taiwanese. Taiwanese, and then she got Nico over here praying in French, and then you got, <laughs> uh, what's his name, uh, Fabrice over there praying in Swahili. Like, there was power in that international prayer. I believe that God does amazing things when people pray. I believe that this is a year, James 5, 16 year, that we will not just pray, but we will pray effectual, fervent prayers that will avail much in your life. And if you're sitting here in this place this morning, And you say, Pastor, I am struggling with that broken heart. If when I'm talking about the fact that, you know, I spend time reading the word and it makes sense in my head, but it never seems to actually change the way that I live. But in my brain, it makes sense. I know what the scripture says, but I just don't, I don't seem to live it. And I'm just wrecked with an emotional roller coaster from day to day. I don't have a reserve to pull from. If you're in that place and you say, I'm broken and I need, I need help, I need healing and you're willing to trust God with that hurt this morning, I want to invite you guys to come on up this morning. And Brandon and Wendy and Lauren and myself, we want to just, we want to pray over you. We're not going to make it weird. You don't have to fall over. You don't have to scream or do anything. We just want to partner with the work that we believe that God is doing. You see, Hannah came to a brokenness in her life that she wasn't afraid to become undone before the, before the Lord. That even when the, the priest, the pastor, Eli, came up to her and began to question her, she wasn't shaken in her focus because she was so desperate for a change. I just wonder, are you desperate enough this morning for a change within your life that you're saying, God, I'm willing to take a step and do something different, do something that might be a little uncomfortable so that I could see healing begin? I'm telling you, Holy Spirit wants to do a healing work in your life today. Would you guys... If you need that this morning, would you please come forward and let us just take a moment and minister to you? Come on up. This is your chance. This is your call.